Hi, my name is Alexandra, and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt, where we talk about literature. Today, we are continuing our discussion of The Tenant of Wildfall Hall. In my first episode, I went over some of the core concepts that really are important to this novel, and today we'll be covering two of them, religion and vices. So let's begin with religion. Uh, this novel is very much informed by the Christian perspective, but it's also nuanced and complex. The introduction to this Oxford Press version, which is the one that I read from, hints at this issue. As you may know, Anne's father was a pastor. Anne attended Cohen Bridge, a school with Calvinist leanings. Here she became sick and had a crisis of faith around these Calvinist teachings. A quick survey of predestination can be um, outlined with the acronym, acronym TULIP. So the T stands for total depravity of man. So it just means that man needs a savior. Man is uh, corrupted by sin nature and absolutely needs a savior to be saved. Um, unconditional election, meaning that the elect are saved and selected by God, not by the individual's free will. Limited atonement, so this means that Christ's death was sufficient and effective for those who were the elect of God. Um, irresistible grace, meaning that the grace by which you're saved is completely effective and that it's beyond, you know, you can't resist it, it's irresistible, it's beyond your free will um, and you're absolutely saved. And the preservation of the saints, meaning that you're once you're saved, you're always saved. There's nothing that you can do to lose your salvation. As you can see from these tenets, which is just a brief outline of some of the Calvinist teachings, there's a lot to be learned there, so do not consider that an exhaustive exploration of that um, doctrine. But it's understandable even from there why a sensitive Anne or a sensitive personality type in general might have a hard time receiving them peaceably. There would be a lot of internal guilt and questioning about knowing whether or not she herself was saved. Um, during her illness, she was counseled by a Moravian minister whose doctrine of universal salvation, or, I'm going to try and pronounce this, apocatastasis, uh, which includes the idea that hell is a temporary state and that all free moral creatures will eventually share in salvation, helped Anne recover her health and her faith. The backdrop of her faith, her questions about the functions of sin and salvation, free will and predestination, certainly inform not only her experiences and about her brother's affair, but also informs the question of virtues and vices that string throughout this novel. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this moral framework and address some of these vices. Through Helen's journal, we learn that at the age of 18, she gets married to the handsome and flirtatious Arthur Huntington. Throughout their marriage, we get a stark look at Arthur's vices. It's really easy to see where he has failed and he's a wicked person. It's hard not to be shocked by the brutal honesty of this view of marriage. When you think about the fact that it was published in Victorian era, it's no wonder that this work was extremely controversial. And like I said, it's really easy to identify Mr. Huntington's device, vi devices, vices for the love of everything good. If I say that again, I mean vices, okay guys? He drinks too much, he cheats on her, he's mean, he's abusive. All of this behavior is tied to character flaws in his part. So I wanna kind of break it down by contrast to the fruits of the spirit in the Bible, which are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So his alcoholism shows a lack of self-control. His affair shows a lack of love. You might also think of this as selfless love, right? So his relationship, um, or a selfish love. Um, his relationship with his son also shows a selfish love. So these are his two character flaws, selfishness and intemperance. And as good as Helen is, she's not without her vices either, which makes her a very interesting character. We see a great deal of growth in her character as well through her painful relationship with Mr. Huntington. Early in the diary portion, she relays a conversation that she has with her aunt about her confidence in her self not to marry foolishly and marry someone who's not worthy of her. 
we learn that Helen is both beautiful and rich, making her a target for a man who would want to take advantage of her. In that conversation, she reveals a bit of undue pride. She spurns the advice of her aunt, who is clearly speaking from a place of love and care for her. As Helen tries to justify her growing attraction to Mr. Huntington, she says that she will be able to lead him uh, to noble pursuits and will improve his character by her efforts. Helen's perspective is even more foolish than it would be if someone in our modern age had that because of the huge power inequality of the time. Once she becomes his wife, we see how fully she is in, her, in his power. She, cannot leave, she cannot, does not own anything, she's squirreling away and hiding money, which she can take at any moment. Um, he can take away her painting supplies, he can lock her in the house, she has no freedom to travel, she has no autonomy, she is not her own person, she is the property of her husband. And this absolute powerlessness is so well explored in this novel. Another character whose vices are worth investigating is Annabella Wilmot, who later gets married and becomes Lady Lowborough. Um, she is very beautiful and very vain. It's easy to see her vanity as her vice. Mr. Huntington is also vain in his own way. While his vanity is motivated ultimately by selfishness or self-indulgence, her vanity is motivated by the desire to have power over other people. Finally, let's take a look at Ralph Hattersley. He marries Helen's close friend, Millicent, who is quieter and more mild-mannered than Helen. Throughout the novel, there is often a debate between Hattersley and Huntingdon of who married the better wife. Should they have married the wife who is so quiet and so passive she gives him whatever he wants, i.e. Millicent, or should they have married a wife who endeavors to make them better, like Helen? Hattersley is very similar to Huntingdon in his vices. He drinks too much, he's mean to Millicent, he's selfish, he's self-indulgent, yet he is not quite as cruel. When he is mean to Hel Millicent, he does it in the belief that he's just teasing her, that she's not all that hurt by what he does, no harm, no foul. Helen speaks up for Millicent, who does not speak up for herself, and Hattersley eventually changes his attitude towards her and becomes a loving husband. So that's all I have to share with you for today. I hope you enjoyed our discussion about religion and vices as it relates to The Tenet of Wild Fell Hall. In the next episode, we're going to be tackling marriage and feminism. So if you want to support my channel, hit that like, hit that subscribe. If you're looking for additional ways to support, you can consider becoming a patron. The links are always in the description below, along with all of my social links. I am at a lovely John everywhere. And until next time, I'm Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile.